everybody, Josh from Silka here with five mistakes that I commonly see people making with tubeless uh, rims, tires, disc brakes. Um, so let's just jump in. Five things. Number one, pressure. Uh, we all remember 10, 15 years ago, pressure was a more is better variable for people, right? Some is good, more is better. Uh, everybody was running the max sidewall uh, pressure on the tire. Not everybody, but most people. We now know that's not true, right? Silk has done a ton of work there. The folks at Zip have done a lot of work there. Flow Cycles, uh, Renee Hurst, Bicycle Quarterly. Um, it, it's pretty universally proven uh, in the science. University of Delft, uh, UNLV actually have labs where they're they're studying this actively. You know, kids are getting PhDs in this topic. It, tire pressure is not a maximize or a minimize. It is an optimize variable. And... Uh, Scary enough, I still go to events where people come up to me and they want that max sidewall pressure. So if you're watching this video, you probably know that that is not what you want. So please tell your friends. <laughs> Do everybody a solid. Uh, tell them that it's, it's not safe, it's not fast, and it's not comfortable. But the other thing that I'm starting to see, and we saw this quite a bit at, at gravel events this year, is people coming up and saying, your tire pressure calculator's way too high. Don't you know that lower pressure is faster? So, well, yeah, we kind of discovered that. Um, and remember, our tire pressure calculator is the only one that uses actual test data where we have tested across pressures and found that breakpoint to pinpoint what the fastest pressure is for a rider of that weight on a tire of that size on that particular surface. So, um, you know, the one thing I will give you on our tire pressure calculator is that it is typically uh, done with professional athletes. I mean, probably 80% of the 5,000 plus data points are world tour athletes. They are lower body fat than you or I. They theoretically may have a slightly higher break point uh, because they have lower body hysteresis because they're, they're just so fit. So, you know, take the pressure calculator number, maybe go a couple below um, if you're a little bit bigger like me. Um, but the other thing that I think people are missing with all the calculators, and uh, it confuses people with ours, is that the tire pressure acts on the effective diameter of the tire. It doesn't matter what it says on the sidewall. As the effective diameter of the tire um, grows, the tire gets stiffer at the same pressure. And this is why it is so critical to measure the stinking tire. Right? So we'll put a link below to some uh, inexpensive calipers that you can find on Amazon or somewhere. But, you know, just because it says 32 doesn't mean that it's 32. My current favorite wheel set, this uh, 3T Discus 4540, has a 29-millimeter inner bead width. I run 32-millimeter GP5000s on there. They caliper at 36.5 millimeters wide. That is a huge difference, 32 to 36 and a half for the same tire just because of the rim it's on. So you really need to be using calipers to get the measured uh, casing uh, width or diameter for the wheel that you're running. With that, you will really be able to dial your pressure in to find that sweet spot of comfort uh, and speed. The last thing I will say there is if the calculators are telling you a pressure above what either your rim or tire say uh, is optimal, or above its max. You know, a lot of the hookless rims out there have a 72 PSI max. Um, if the calculator is telling you something bigger than that, that's a sign that you need a larger tire. So don't, uh, people write into the inbox uh, here all the time, you know, it says I need 78, is that safe? Well, it, it might not be. What that really is telling you is that, you know, that 32 millimeter tire should be a 35 um, because that would get you back into that, that safe range. And honestly, it's probably gonna be a more comfortable ride and it's not going to be any slower than the slightly narrower tire. So check your pressures. Number two, the install and removal of, uh, of tubeless tires. Now, if you're old like me and you've been around, there's a lot of stuff that we were all taught back in the day with tubes or tubulars that it doesn't hold anymore in this tubeless world. And uh, probably the big one is the orientation of the valve when you're installing and removing. And so what we've got here, we've got a cross section of the tubeless rim. And you see there's two shelves where the bead sits and they typically have like a little bump or something to kind of lock the bead in once. That's the popping that you hear when the tire beads up on install. 
Um, those little lock buttons keep the tire from being able to creep into that center channel if you have a catastrophic loss of pressure or a, a flat on the road. But that channel is there to help you both uh, install and remove the tire, and you, you have to take advantage of it or you're really going to risk uh, damaging your rim uh, or, or breaking your tire lever or, or your bead uh, jack installation tool, depending on how you're doing it. And the way to think of this is that the tire is a fixed circumference, but you can locally have a larger uh, radius uh, if, if the circumference is at a smaller radius somewhere else. And so if we look at it from the side, you think of if I put my first bit of bead in at the bottom and I push it up into that channel, and I work it around, the tire is now working its way around a smaller radius. But because the circumference is fixed, you are going to have additional radius left at the end that you can use to get over the bead. Um, so this is super critical when you're installing. You want to have the valve stem more or less at the top. I tend to run mine. At, don't run it right at uh, 12 o'clock, but run it, you know, call it 11 uh, or, or 1. You get the tire up in that groove, work it all around, making sure it's down in the groove, uh, or up in the groove, I guess, depending on the orientation here, all the way, and that's what's gonna give you that last uh, extra bit of bead to come, uh, to come over the bead of the rim. I say, too, you, you should not be using tire levers to install tires. We, we see rim damage this way, people break levers, uh, you know, you hear of people getting hurt. You can look this up. You know, when the, if a tire lever lets go on you, especially, you know, the, most of them are plastic, uh, if they snap, it, you can really cut yourself pretty bad. Uh, there are tire levers like the, the Silka one, which I actually have here, that has a metal core uh, with plastic. But, you know, these are not meant for installing. These are just meant for removing. You, chances are, and particularly with these tubeless tire levers, are much narrower and much smaller. Um, than they were in the past, and that really helps you get the tire off, but it really can put a lot of pressure uh, point load on the rim when you're getting it back on. So these really are not designed for tire install. But yeah, I would say in general, if you're needing tire levers to get it on, you're probably either not fully up into that groove or you have the valve somewhere down uh, in, in the bottom half of the wheel. And the way to think of that is the valve protrudes into that groove. And so it's going to create a local uh, increase in the radial distance um, that's basically taking up extra bead, giving you less when you get to the top. Instead of this, and we'll drop a link below, use one of these. This is called a bead jack. Um, you can get these things on Amazon. We don't make one, but I think this one was like $15 on Amazon. And uh, this actually allows you to sit on the opposite bead and pull the tire over uh, this way. And what that does is it gives you a nice, uh, a nice section with good control of the bead. Um, and then all the forces are vertical into the bead. They're not bending uh, against it. So again, I have seen you know, people can bend aluminum rims and typically I mean, you can crack a carbon rim, but I would say more likely your people are scratching them when they're using tire levers to get it over because it's the, the tire lever really needs to climb kind of up and over that surface, uh, which can cause scratching. So the, the bead jack really eliminates that. So uh, if, if you have some tires that are giving you extra trouble, try those techniques. Make sure it's in. Make sure your valve's at the top. Buy a bead jack. It'll make it so much easier. Number three, uh, trainer riding. And there's not a whole lot more I can say here. Riding the trainer is absolute hell on your entire bicycle and it is torture on the wheels. And the, the couple things that you need to think about are, you know, most of the wheels on the market, I mean, really most all of them are using, call it a carbon or aluminum rim, an aluminum or brass spoke nipple, a stainless spoke, and then an aluminum hub shell that typically has stainless bearings in it. When you are sweating, um, your headset kind of stem area are taking the bulk of the sweat, but so much of that is coming down the fork onto the wheel um, and, and down the fork legs into the hub. And so you have really just a recipe for a galvanic nightmare. You've got stainless next to aluminum, uh, which is a galvanic risk. You oftentimes have aluminum nipples in a carbon rim, which is a big galvanic risk. Um, sometimes it's brass, which is a little bit better, but in the uh, presence of sweat, 
which has salt and trace amounts of ammonia in it, you, you just have a massive acceleration of corrosion, uh, mostly of the galvanic type. Um, but, but also some of it is just, particularly with aluminum, some of it can just be straight corrosion of the aluminum depending on the ammonia in your sweat. Uh, we've got some pictures here that we, from the internet. You see that uh, you know, a lot of these are carbon rims just, cra or aluminum rims just cracking and failing from uh, the, the material damage caused by the sweat. And then you have the galvanic issues where spoke nipples, particularly on the bottom, uh, the bottom half of the wheel, really just turning to dust. Um, it's amazing how many people I, I've seen and heard of, and you see the stories on the internet where they're riding, they're Zwifting, they're on the trainer, and their front wheel just lets go. They think, oh, it's, it must just be so much force on the wheel to ride Zwift. Well, it's not that it's so much force, it's that it's so much corrosion. So the way you can really think about the, or fixing this is, you know, for one, um, rather than ruin a nice wheel, I, I would get a Wahoo Kicker Climb. Uh, it makes the inside riding a whole lot more fun. It is relatively uh, designed and built to be corrosion resistant. Nothing's corrosion proof. But uh, the way I th thought of it for my own purchases, you know, if I'm going to ride this thing enough, I will actually save money using a climb over any of the nice wheels that I have. The other thing you can do is just buy a cheap uh, junky wheel to ride on the front uh, to, to save your nice wheels for, for outdoor riding. So uh, when you build the wheels, make sure that you're, or you're buying wheels, you know, make sure you're using a good anti-seize or a spoke prep. Um, and then the other thing you can do if you have no other option is clean the bike regularly. And remember, wiping is not washing, right? Wiping everything down uh, gets it off the external surfaces, but it does nothing to flush out the salt and the ammonia and the other uh, kind of toxins that are getting into all the nooks and crannies. You really need a wet wash uh, with uh, copious amounts of clean water and ideally a good soap um, to get that stuff out. So if you have to use your nice wheel indoor on the trainer, I would probably be washing it, honestly, weekly or bi-weekly um, just to make sure I'm not having problems down the road. Number four, rotors. This is something we didn't have to think about uh, 20 years ago, really. And now all of us had disc, disc brakes everywhere. A couple of things that maybe just don't always think about, but squeaking and squealing and noise almost always in the disc brake is coming from some sort of oil or grease getting on there and then contaminating the pad. Um, the key to really solving this is don't touch it and don't let anything oily or greasy touch it. Um, this is why we say, you know, no aerosol lubricants on the bike, right? Spraying an aerosol lubricant on your chain, you've got the disc brake just, you know, six, five, six centimeters away. Um, it, it's, a, it's a huge contamination risk. It's also why when I talk to Shimano and SRAM, you know, they both say no uh, lubricant on the threads for the lock ring or if it's a six bolt, don't use grease there. They are worried that, that any grease you put in here will uh, soften or melt under heat and be f flung and, or migrate outward and cause a contamination risk. Uh, the, the way you get around that is to use an anti-seize product, and the way I do it is actually put the anti-seize on the uh, hub thread and then screw it in. That way, sometimes if you, if you put it on the lock ring thread, it can then migrate out under this face. It, it really doesn't migrate well at all, even when it's extremely hot, but by putting it on the, uh, the hub side first, you really eliminate the ability for it to to migrate out even if you know you were to see a thousand degrees, which you won't um, in the setup here. So when you're installing and removing or doing anything with this, don't touch it. Um, the, the last thing I would say with this that I see pretty commonly are people getting these bent out of true from traveling, uh, either on the airline or you know, taking the wheel off to put it in like the trunk of a car, uh, something like that, you can really get yourself in trouble. You know, you put the wheel in with the disc on the bottom side and then you put something over it and there's a, a side load in it that can pull the disc out of true. There are little truing tools you can use, but once it's bent sufficiently, it can be really hard to, uh, to, to get it just right because it seems like every time you move it in one spot, it, the, the out of true just kind of moves 
somewhere different. Whenever I travel with a bike, uh, in the airline for sure, I take the discs off and I actually put them in like a, a FedEx overnight package, right? Just a cardboard sleeve that it can sit in. You put the two of them together uh, to, to, and then put them in a place where you can really guarantee that they're not going to take a lot of load. Uh, but as you can see, when they're mounted on the wheel and you've got that overhung uh, disc surface, it really is not going to do well if it's subjected to a side load. So um, keep them clean. Don't touch them. Keep lubricants away from them. If you do get a squeal, you can use a product like the Silka Brake and Drivetrain Cleaner. Um, it is really good at getting some of that stuff off. Uh, but yeah, the, the easiest way is to just not get it on there in the first place. So take care of your discs. Step five, inspect the wheel. And this is, let me pull this back up again. This is a huge one uh, anymore, and I would say, again, especially if you're riding the trainer, um, you really need to be inspecting the hub, the spokes, at the nipples, somewhat routinely. And I would say, every personally, every time I wash the bike, I do a really good uh, kind of look around. You think of um, uh, hub shell cracking and the spoke pulling out catastrophically or suddenly while you're riding. It can be really bad. So just... When you clean everything, you know, really look in there. Look for any cracks, any sort of weird corrosion. Is there any white powder coming out of anywhere? That's typically, uh, you know, that's aluminum oxide that forms in uh, galvanic corrosion. You, know, you want to look at where the spoke to the nipple and the nipple to the rim. And then you really want to look at the tire. Uh, and particularly with these tubeless tires on modern carbon rims, you really want to look at the interface here where the tire is uh, essentially touching the rim. Modern tires have gotten so thin and so light, which makes them so supple and so beautiful to ride, but you can get friction, uh, or you will get friction, at the interface from the tire sidewall there, at the bead and the rim, and particularly with carbon rims, uh, which can be a little bit abrasive, you can actually, you, over time, you will actually see a little bit of a breakdown of the uh, fibers in the casing sidewall. So this is most notable on uh, handmade open tubular style tires like we see from uh, Vittoria Challenge, those brands, where they just have a little bit less protective rubber coating on the side. Um, you know, Continental tires, I feel like you see a lot, they have a protective layer there, and as that layer starts to break down, you'll get threads that are wanting to come out. You, know, you want to really inspect for those, clip them off, but keep an eye on that because uh, it, it potentially could become a safety thing if, you know, the bike is, you know, you're riding it and riding it, you're never looking at it, and particularly if you know, all this stuff is hidden under dirt, it could lead to a catastrophic uh, tire blowout in time. It, it's super easy. It maybe takes 30 seconds to inspect the full circumference of, uh, you know, all four tire beads. So inspect, look for cracks, look for white powder, check those beads. Of course, look at your tread, make sure there's no, you know, especially with sealants and things now, you, you can get a staple or something in your tire and not even know it's there until you, uh, you, you really look for it and find it. So there right, you go. Thanks everybody for watching. And uh, if you like this video, check out one of these in our maintenance series and uh, please give us your questions, comments, uh, thoughts you have. Do you agree with everything I said? Do you disagree? What tips and tricks do you have? Put them below. We'll cover them in a future video. Be sure to hit like and subscribe. Mm -hmm.